Welcome to an ultralight airplane design video from the ultralight airplane workshop. In this video, we're going to talk about safety of the design of the UWS-4 ultralight airplane that we're designing. And if you happen to be new to this design series, we're using a book by Dan Raver called Simplified Aircraft Design for Home Builders. And we're using this book as a guide in designing our ultralight airplane. And by the way, when I say ultralight airplane, in this case, I'm talking about a United States Federal Aviation Regulation Part 103 ultralight airplane. And that's an airplane that's usually much lighter than ultralight airplanes in other parts of the world. And that's simply because Part 103 requires that the empty weight of our airplane be less than 254 pounds. And that's around 115 kilograms. In this video, we're covering Chapter 6 of Dan's book, and he has titled that chapter, Buckle Up for Safety. So that's what this video is about, designing for various safety aspects of our airplane. And there's three things we're going to cover in this video. One is crashworthiness. How can we design the structure to allow a pilot to survive a crash? Of course, there's limits to what we can do, especially since we have such a small empty weight limit on our airplane. Doing seat belt restraining the pilot and a parachute, in this case, a whole airplane parachute. So we're going to talk about these things in this video. Let's get to it. As I said, we've been using Dan's book to design our airplane. There's been a series of videos here covering Dan's book and the design of the UWS-4. In the last video, we covered lofting, which basically drawing the airplane to be smooth, to be aerodynamic. I'll put a link up here in the upper right hand corner to that video in case you haven't seen it yet. Now I do want to say that if you're following along in this series and you've heard me say this a number of times, in these video series, we're only using the parts of Dan's book that are applicable to our aircraft design. Dan covers a lot in his book that we're not going to talk about here in this series. For example, in the last video covering lofting, Dan talked about some really interesting ways to hand draw the lines of our airplane in order to make it smooth. But I'm using OpenVSP, so I didn't talk about Dan's method for hand drawing. I talked about how I use OpenVSP to get smooth lines. So that's a good example of how Dan might be using something in his book that you would find useful and helpful that I'm not going to cover in this video series. Now, if you might be interested in Dan's book, there's going to be a link down in the description of this video that you can click on that will take you to a web page at the Ultralight Airplane Design Workshop. There's a number of links there for different books that I use, and one of them is going to be for this book that Dan's written. Now, if you happen to click on that link, it'll take you to Amazon, and if you buy the book while you're on that link, the Ultralight Airplane Workshop will get a small cut of those proceeds. Now, let's get to talking about some of the safety design for this airplane. So let's cover designing for crash survivability. In other words, making the structure strong enough or design it so that it's able to absorb a crash impact and then have the pilot survive that impact. Well, this is one of the things that's very, very difficult for us to do in a Part 103 ultralight airplane. We just don't have much weight margin available that we can use to throw at this structural design to make it survivable. It's not like a car. Someone comes out with airbags and you just add airbags to the car. That's going to add weight to the car, but in general, cars don't have some upper weight limit that they have to adhere to in their design. Whereas for this ultralight airplane, we have a very strict upper weight limit, and we can't go over that weight limit. So designing the structure to be crash worthy is very difficult for us to do. Not to say that we can't do anything, but there are some things we might be able to do to help. Some things we just can't. We just don't have the weight allowance. So one of the things you might be able to do to try to design an airframe to be crash survivable is to have a little crumple area to absorb some of that energy to reduce the G's that the pilot's going to feel on impact. Now the kinds of mishaps we're likely to have in an airplane will generally have the front hitting the ground and or the bottom hitting the ground. So those are the directions we generally have to think about having a crumple area. Now I'm really talking about the fuselage here. For example, if the wingtip hits the ground first, it's really its own crumple area, so we don't need to worry about that. What if the tail hits the ground first? Well, again, it's its own crumple area, so we don't need to worry about that. But the fuselage is a different story. We really don't want the whole fuselage to crumple. We need to protect the pilot. Now, one thing that we can do is to help decelerate the pilot by having a little crumple area below the seat. That, and that could be as simple as something like some little four inch high bulkheads that can crumple. That wouldn't add a whole lot of weight. Another thing that we can do is we can have the pilot sitting on a four inch thick cushion. Another thing that we can do is have legs of a seat, if we have legs on the seat, have those be able to crumple and absorb some impact. 
Now, I said we probably don't need to deal with crumple area on top of the airplane, but we do have to think about having the airplane roll over, particularly a tail dragger. It's very possible for the legs of the airplane to, to get caught on something like soybeans, if we happen to land in a soybean field, and have it nose over and have the airplane land on its back. So we have to make sure that the heads of the pilot won't get squished and have the top of the airplane squish into the head of the pilot if we have a rollover. So that's something we need to think about in our structure. A rollover is probably one of the highest probability of incidents that we're gonna have. So we really do need to think about that. And that is one of the things that I talked about in the structure video. And by the way, if you haven't seen the overall high level structure design video, I'll put a link to that up here in the upper right hand corner. We also need to be able to get out of the airplane and this is a particular issue for a low wing airplane and that's what the UWS-4 is. You need a way to get out of the airplane if you've rolled over on the back. And then another thing to deal with, which isn't necessarily deal with the crash, is should we think about how to handle a bird strike or a tree branch strike if we have to be coming down at, with an emergency landing and we hit a tree or hit some branches on a tree. So should we think about that issue? So while I was doing some research on this issue, something beyond what Dan had in his book, I ran across this very interesting document from the NATO RTO office. They did an analysis on airplane crash survival. And I found some of what was in there very interesting and something that we might be able to use here in the future. We're actually doing some structural design and we need to know some load numbers, particularly if we want to think about crash survivability. And I wanted to share some of this with you. We won't spend a whole lot of time on it. In this video, we're actually not doing any number crunching or analysis. We're just looking at what we need to look into when we get to the load design and the structure design. So this was kind of interesting. They said that most crashes can be simplified or analyzed with their G loading as a little triangle shape. And so your acceleration rate generally is a fairly steep constant slope. It hits a peak and then the fairly steep constant slope coming back down. So this would be zero G down here and then it comes up. There's an average here that's halfway up and then you got your peak. So you can calculate this peak if you know some of these other numbers. For example, if you know your velocity, you already know what G is, that's Earth G, and then the stopping distance. So if you can calculate some of these numbers, you can actually calculate your peak and your average G load. So that's good to know. Then they have these other numbers in here that are interesting, and they have to do with G loads that humans can survive, human tolerance limits. They did these tests in six different directions. So it'd be like forward and backward, up and down, and left and right. Well, the only ones we're really interested in is when the bottom impacts the ground or at the front impacts the ground. So those are the ones we're mostly interested in. So that would be this first one, and they're calling it the inertial response of the body is eyes down, so you're being pushed up in the positive G direction. So you can tolerate 20 to 25 Gs. Now what about a front impact? In the front impact, we're going to be pushed backwards. So we're accelerating in the plus X direction. So in that case, it's eyeballs out and your tolerance level is 45 Gs. Now we don't have to worry quite as much about left and right, the lateral. We don't have to worry about quite as much about the upside down, which would be the minus G, that tailward. If we flip over, we probably won't encounter many Gs there. So let's not worry about that one. And just as a frame of reference, they're talking about the time duration of the impulse being 0.1 seconds, so 100 milliseconds, and the pilot being fully restrained. So these are G limits for that condition. Now frequently, the kind of injury that a pilot will get is when they impact some inside part of the airplane. And so there are a number of diagrams in the book that show how your body parts or how your head or various parts of your body are going to flail about depending on which direction you're impacting. So here's one that's kind of interesting that has one of the larger head movements. So if you had something like a yoke or a stick that's sticking up about here, your head's going to impact that. So you want to make sure that your yoke is either in front of or below where this head position would be on impact. And by the way, this is with the shoulder harness. In fact, it's a five point harness, it looks like. So that's also good to know for positioning various parts inside the airplane. Let's talk about these various items for the UWS-4. Let's talk about crumple or deceleration area on the front and the bottom of the airplane. So here's a view of the structure of the fuselage or pod area of the UWS-4. 
So if you can look down here on the bottom, I've got about three inches from the very bottom of the airplane to the bottom tube of the structure. And I've got another three inches or so of cushion area for the pilot. So that gives me roll roughly six, seven inches of crush depth for the pilot's bottom itself. That will help protect the spine of the pilot if we hit belly first. Then I also put some crumple area up here in the very front. So this will be either some foam or a composite or aluminum. I haven't figured that out yet, but that at least gives me a few inches of crumple up here in the front to try to absorb from some impact. It's not a whole lot, I'll grant you that, but we don't really have a whole lot of weight margin to spare to add more crumple area here or crumple area up here. Now for the pilot, what I could either use a seat cushion in here for some deceleration space, or I could build the seat so it has the structure can crumple a little bit and crumple down. I haven't quite decided on that. I'm almost certain I'm going to use a seat cushion here that's nice and thick to have a little compression area for the pilot. I'll work on that when I get a little bit closer to the uh, final structural design. Let's see, we already talked a lot about the rollover structure in the structure video. We'll cover that just a little bit right now. So once again, we've got the top part here of the airplane. The 25% cord, which would be close to the CG, is right around in this area here. That's pretty close to the highest part of the airplane. So we got a little bit of depth here before we start impacting this tube structure here for the airplane. I believe in a simple rollover, the instrument panel will be strong enough to hold the weight of the airplane as it's rolling over. So we would have a line about here, which would just barely keep the pilot's head from impacting the ground if this crushed in. So you do have at least some rollover protection here. Now here's the problem that we have with rollover that I haven't quite figured out how to solve yet, and that's getting out of the airplane after we roll over, because we're going to be resting right about in this area, and this was going to be a plexiglass area. Now, if I have a hinge coming down through this area, I don't think that would be big enough for a door to get in and out of. So I have a feeling this canopy is going to have to hinge over to the side on one side and be hinged over on the side, which means I won't be able to open the canopy to get out if I'm rolled over on the back. So what I think I'm going to have to do is make the canopy out of plexiglass that can be fractured instead of out of Lexan and I'll just have to have a hammer secured inside my cockpit in a good spot that I can reach and break the canopy if I need to to get out and then crawl out that way. Because then the airplane would be resting on this point here and this point here and I should be able to crawl out in an opening that's that big if I'm just laying on the ground which would be right in here. So that's my current plan. It's not a great plan, <laughs> I'll admit that, but I'm having a little trouble coming up with a better solution. Since I have some unanswered questions about this layout for the tubing, for the cabin, and the fuselage, I'm giving some serious thought to making a mock-up of this tubing structure for the fuselage and cabin. Now for the mock-up, I would just use square wood dowels and glue those together instead of using steel tubing. I have plenty of scrap wood that I can use for this purpose. Now of course this wouldn't be for structural testing, this would be for fit. So I'd mock up a seat, maybe put some foam in there, mock up an instrument panel, put the tubes where they're supposed to be, and just see if it fits right. And then I can also do a little rollover test. Roll this thing over, be in it with a five-point harness, disconnect the five-point harness, see if I can crawl out from underneath it. So don't be surprised if before too long, I do a video about this. And then we come to the last item, which is how to deal with a bird strike or a tree branch strike. Now my initial thought was I could, let's swing over here, put in a tube or rod that would be about here and then come down somewhere in this area. So right in here, that would help protect the pilot from a tree branch coming through and smack him in the face. And I still might do that. On that one, I haven't decided. I'm gonna put off on deciding that until a, bit, a little bit later. That would add weight to the airplane. So if I have some weight margin at the end of the airplane, I might go ahead and do that. If I don't have the weight margin, I'll just have to leave it out. Now for bird impact, I just don't think that there's much I can do to deal with that. If I hit something like a turkey buzzard, they are fairly common here in Eastern Kansas. So there's always that possibility, but I just don't think I can build a structure strong enough and light enough 
to survive a impact with something like a 10 pound bird. I'm going to keep thinking about it. I'm not, I'm not going to give up on it. I actually did think of one possibility, particularly if I were to put those bars in here, I would have to probably put curved bars in here for the tree branch impact. What you could then possibly do, which I don't think is practical, is to put a wire mesh between those bars. That would then protect you from both a tree branch impact and from a bird impact. And you could do a wire mesh, something like a chicken wire. I'm kind of reluctant to do that. It will obstruct the view just a little bit. Not a whole lot, but it would obstruct the view a little bit. And it would add weight. But I'm going to keep it in the back of my mind. So now we come to safety using a seat belt. Now, of course, seat belt is designed to restrain the pilot to keep them in the airplane in the event of a crash. And to keep them from, for example, if you didn't have a seat belt in a crash, you're likely to move forward and slam into the canopy, the instrument panel, the control stick, other things inside the airplane, and get injured just from that. Whereas if you had a seat belt, you'd be restrained and you wouldn't get those injuries. You might get some other injury, but at least you wouldn't get that impact inside the airplane injury. Now I found a really nice article in Kit Planes Magazine, at least on their website, written by Leroy Cook. And as a quick aside, Leroy Cook was the flight instructor for my dad when he was taking flight instruction at the Butler Municipal Airport in Butler, Missouri. It's not really important, but I thought it was pretty cool. But anyway, the article that Leroy wrote is dated March 23rd, 2020, and it's called Build It Right, Belting Your Home Built. And I think he had a lot of really good information in that article. Now, Federal Aviation Requirement Part 23 has a lot of good information in it about how to build an airplane and build it safely. Now, Part 23 has paragraph 23.56, which gives you some information on how you should design your airplane, whether it's a normal or utility category, to restrain the pilot and to keep them from incurring serious injury up to certain G loads. Now, the latest revision apparently uses a 250 pound pilot instead of the standard 170 pound pilot, which is probably a good thing. So you need to be able to restrain the pilot in up to nine G's forward. In other words, that should try to keep the move pilot moving forward up to nine G's, three G upward, and then 1.5 G sideways. So that at least gives us some good design or criteria to design our restraint system to. That means we don't have to design up to the requirements we saw in that NATO RTO article, because that would be a lot of G's to restrain a pilot to. And this is considering the real weight limitations that we have on airplanes. In order to restrain a pilot up to those other G limits we saw in the NATO article, that would require a massive amount of structure and some significant weight. So the FAR.23 requirements are trying to be more realistic about the kinds of loads we need to restrain a pilot for in our very light airplanes. Since we're building home builds, and we want to be able to test what we built, Leroy provided some good load testing criteria to use. So if you're using a four point or five point harness, you need to assume that you're going to have to have about a 2,500 pound load test. And I did a quick calculation. That's not too far off on this 9G number using a 250 pound pilot. So that's about right. He said that 60% of that 2,500 pound loads has to be taken by the lap belt. I should have put lap belt down here. And then 40% of that load should be taken by the shoulder harness. So now we have some load limits that we know we can test to to see if our seat belt's going to work. And there's also a couple other good ideas in here to think about that I hadn't thought about. And one is you don't want to have excessive webbing. And webbing is the belt itself. It's usually made out of some kind of plastic thread. And when you start putting a load on that, it's going to stretch. And they're calling that belt a webbing. Now, if it stretches too much, you could move the pilot too far forward and their head may end up impacting the yoke or instrument panel or whatever. So you don't want to use any more webbing than you need to. And then what you should use at the end of the webbing then to reach on back to your attach point is something like a steel cable. And then for the best crash worthiness, applying the load of the pilot down to the seat belt, there are certain angles that you want those belts to be. Now the lap belt should be 45 to 50 degrees relative to horizontal. And the shoulder belt should be something like minus five to 30 degrees relative to horizontal. Let's take a look at that in the UWS-4. So based on what I have for the current structure of the UWS-4 ultralight airplane, I've stuck some belts in here, a lap belt and a shoulder harness. So let's take a look at what we have here. Here's the lap belt. 
and right now it's at 50 degrees from horizontal and we said 45 to 50 so that's within the range of what Leroy Cook recommended and the shoulder harness up here at the top is pretty close to zero degrees horizontal. So the attach point for the lap belt is going to be right down here. This will be a fairly strong attach point, so that's why I want to attach it here. Now, if I wanted a 45 degree attach point, I'd have to attach it up here a little bit higher if I didn't move where this corner was. That's a little bit weaker. It's going to cause this tube to bend on impact when the pilot's pulling on that belt. So that's not quite as desirable. I'll put a little fillet down in here with a hole drilled in it. And that's what we'll use to attach the belt right down in here. So that should be a very strong point. Now back up here on this one, let's take a look at it from the top. So keeping in mind that we don't want this webbing to be very long, I'm going to have the shoulder harness webbing end right here. Then we'll switch to a cable. And that cable will come back and it will attach to this point back here. And again, I will put a fillet down in here between this longitudinal tube and this diagonal tube and we'll put a little hole in that and that's how we will attach the cable back here. And again, this is going to end up being a very strong point back here. Let's look back at the left. This is actually going to be an attached point for three items back here in this corner. We just talked about the seat belt. That's going to be one attached item back here. Next one is going to be the engine mount. So part of the engine mount, the engine will be right in here, part of this engine mount is going to come back here and mount at this point. Now it'll mount with a bolt, but we'll have to make a mounting point back here that the bolt will go through and attach to. And shortly we'll talk about what the third item is that's going to attach back here. Let's talk about another thing that you have to think about in choosing a four-point harness and a five-point harness. Now the four-point harness, you have the lap belt, that's two points, and then you have each shoulder belt, that's another two points. One thing that can happen, especially if you have an impact that's somewhat in this direction here, let me switch to a better pointer. If you have an impact that's along this axis here, is that your pilot, when that impact happens, it can try to slide underneath the lap belt a little bit. So you can see here where they showed the initial position of the pelvis, when you have an impact, it can actually move forward and down just a little bit. It's called submarining and you can get injured from that happening. With a five point harness, you have, have a belt that comes from your central location where all the belts come together, it goes across your crotch and then down. And that helps prevent submarining from happening. And that should reduce your injuries in the event of a crash. Dan talks about a few other things that we just might not think about in our everyday flying that we really should think about. And that's securing items in your cockpit. You don't want things to come loose, fly around, and smacking you in the head when you have a crash. And it's pretty ironic when you put those items in your airplane to help you in the event of a crash. And that would be things like a flashlight. One of the safety items is to have a flashlight, but it's not a safety item if that thing is going to smack you in the back of the head when you have a crash. So you want to be able to really secure that flashlight and any baggage. Another safety item you should have with you is a fire extinguisher, and again, those can be fairly heavy depending on how big a fire extinguisher you get and you really need to secure that down also. Now for me, one of my options if I happen to roll over is that I'm going to have a hard time getting out of my airplane. So I need to be able to break out that windshield. So that windshield breaker that I'm going to have, which is generally shaped like a hammer but has a very sharp point on it, that has to be secured and it has to be where I can reach it if I'm hanging upside down in my seatbelt. A battery, that is one really dangerous thing to not be secured. So of course, you have to have that secured. And then the engine. At some point, we'll probably do another video on securing the engine. One thing that could happen is that you could have a blade break on your engine. And something that we don't normally think about is when that blade breaks, it's going to make a huge imbalance and that engine is going to shake violently. And that could actually break the engine loose from the engine mount or the engine mount from the airframe. Now there really isn't anything we can do to strengthen the bolt holes in the engine case. So it's very possible to have a failure of the case at the bolt holes. So one option I've heard of is to actually use a steel cable where you can bolt the steel cable to a different location on the engine and then bolt it to the airframe. 
So if your engine does break loose, it's probably already broken electric lines, gas lines, and it's probably not running anymore. So if you have that cable, it's probably going to be able to hold the engine fairly well. So that's something to think about. Now I will say, if you're using a propeller that's a proven propeller, it's been around for years and years, there hasn't been a history of failures, it probably isn't worth the wait of putting this extra cable on the engine. But if you're thinking of doing your own propeller, let's say carving your own wood propeller, or maybe designing your own carbon fiber propeller like I'm thinking of doing sometime in the future, then putting this cable between the engine and the airframe probably is worth doing. We've already talked about having a five point seat belt. And then another thing is a parachute. But for us, I think a whole airplane parachute would be the best thing. So that's something we're gonna talk about shortly. The one thing that Dan talks about in his book is flutter. Now this is another one of those issues that for ultralights we don't generally need to think about. In general, and this is a very general statement, it's faster airplanes that need to think about flutter. Now, if you'd like to learn more about flutter, take a look at Dan's book. He does a pretty good job of boiling down what you need to do in order to avoid flutter. But for the faster airplanes, faster than ultralights, it boils down to not only having tight control linkages, you should also have the center of mass of your flap or elevator or rudder or aileron in front of the hinge of that device. Now naturally for ultralights, if you take a look at most of the ultralights on the market, you'll see that almost all of them have the hinge being the very front and all the mass being way behind the hinge. But at our low speeds, we don't have to worry about it. And here's another thing to think about. Now Dan does not mention this in his book, at least not in any detail. I'm thinking of putting a whole plane parachute on the UWS-4. Now the United States FAA Part 103 regulations give us an extra weight allowance to put on a parachute. They give us 24 pounds to do that. So I think it's worth going ahead and doing that. I looked at a couple of websites of manufacturers of ballistic recovery systems and I looked at their documentation for how to set up harnesses and attach points for the airplane. So I've looked at how that would work on the UWS-4 and I've come up with some plans. Now things are a little bit different depending on whether you're a high wing or low wing and whether you're a tractor or a pusher airplane. Now it just so happens since we're a pusher low wing we kind of have the worst of all situations but I think we can still deal with it. The construction materials and style of the airplane can determine the attach points and how many attach points you have. For example one manufacturer said that on ultralights where you have a boom that runs the length of the airplane and that's everything attaches that boom then it probably makes sense to have a single attach point for that. But if you have something like a composite airplane, you really need to distribute the load around a little bit on the airplane, and so you'll generally have multiple attach points. On the UWS-4, I think we're gonna have four attach points. I think we're gonna have two attach points at the front and two at the back. Now, since we're a low wing, and wing spars are one of the normal or common attach points, that's not gonna work for us. And the reason for that is that our wing is gonna be below the CG. Let's bring up a picture of our airplane. And the CG on our airplane is gonna be right about in here. Now let's bring up the spar. So here's the main spar of the airplane. Now that's actually gonna be just a little bit behind 25%, probably just a little bit behind the CG. But let's go ahead and say we wanna do attached to that anyway. What'll happen is if that's our main attach point, when the parachute deploys, it's going to deploy in the direction of the wind. So let's say, let's say we were going forward, straight forward when we deploy. The parachute would then deploy with the line sticking straight back. Well, if our CG is above where that line's gonna start pulling, then the momentum of the airplane is gonna pitch the nose down. And in fact, this particular airplane, if you ignore what the tail's gonna do back there, would be upside down. So you want your attach point on a low wing airplane to actually be above that CG, so it's gonna be up higher someplace. And we'll probably also attach our rear attach points above the CG, but the front one is probably the more important one. Now, one of the things that can happen when the airplane comes down and impacts the ground, especially if it's in a perfectly flat attitude, well, it kind of depends on the position of the pilot. If the spine of the pilot is straight up and down relative to the impact direction, you can actually have some back issues you can have some compression of that lumbar and get a back injury. So if we can, it'd be kind of nice to avoid that issue. On the high wing and tractor configurations, they generally like to have a nose low attitude. So the landing gear, particularly with tricycle gear, with the front nose gear, they want that to impact first and absorb some of the load. So they do a nose low attitude landing. 
And if you're far enough forward, then your pilot's gonna be pitched forward. The back's gonna be kind of in this position, assuming the nose is over here. So you're not gonna have any crushing of that lumbar area. But we have tail dragger. So nose low isn't gonna help us much. We don't have nose gear to absorb that impact energy. And what I've read so far, at least on one manufacturer's website, is even with a low wing pusher, they still recommend either a flat attitude or a slight nose down attitude. Let's take a quick look at our airplane. So this would be the flat attitude. Now, if I did slight nose down, I don't like that because then assuming that we're gonna be impacting up and down, let's see if we were down, nose down like this, then that's probably not a good position. Then we're gonna have some crushing of the lower lumbar area. So I don't like that. Now we could try to do a tail low impact attitude. Now that would certainly be good for the lumbar because then the seat back is going to cushion the pilot a little bit. You're not going to get as much crushing. Now one manufacturer's website kind of wasn't sure if that was a good idea or not. They couldn't find any data that said it was a good idea. And the reason for that is if you're coming down in this direction, your tail is going to be trying to guide the airplane. Well, of course, it's not designed to do that. It's actually designed to be behind the airplane, not in front of the airplane. So apparently it's causing the airplane to swing around quite a bit just because it's not stable. Now they didn't think that was a good idea, although they didn't say why. It doesn't seem like it should be a significant issue. So since I'm not sure if a tail down would be a good idea, I'm going to try to do level. So I'm going to design my harness so we actually come down in level attitude. Now that is not as much protection for the back as I would like. So I may end up changing my plans in the future and do a slight tail down. Now there's another thing to think about here for this tail dragger. I'm going to actually have two impacts. In this kind of attitude or in the flat attitude, the landing gear, the main gear is going to hit first. And then a moment later, the tail is going to impact. So I'm going to have wham one and wham two. And wham two isn't gonna be that big a deal, but it is gonna cause your head to swing back. And I'm gonna to have to have a headrest here to prevent the head from swinging back and smacking these bars back here. And then another thing that's recommended is that you have a Kevlar harness that's attached to the airframe. There are gonna be one or more harness straps that will then come to an attach point, And you can have a bridle that extends onto the riser of the parachute. But the distance from where it attaches to the plane to where it attaches the riser should be at least 10 feet. And that is for a pusher configuration. And the reason for that is that with a pusher configuration, it's very possible that harness is gonna get tangled up in your prop if you forget to turn off the motor before you deploy your parachute. And that's one of the things I talk about a number of times with the pusher configuration. You have to turn off the motor before you deploy your parachute. So let's take a look at that. So we're gonna have some attach points somewhere on this airplane. And when the parachute deploys, it's very possible that that harness is gonna come back here and be hit by the prop if it's still running. So they want to have a Kevlar harness back here. So that's less likely to actually cut that harness line and then your parachute of course would be of no use. And the other issue is possibly even if it doesn't cut the harness line, it can get wrapped up in here and pull the parachute bridle way up in here. So they acknowledge the possibility that your engine could still be running when you deploy the parachute, and so they want to have a Kevlar harness. Now let's talk about where we're going to attach that. So here's what I'm thinking of for the harness. This would be Kevlar, like we just said. I'm going to have the harness attached back here where the engine mount is and where the seat belt shoulder harness comes back and attaches. Let's look at that. So this corner here, this corner here. And then for the front harness, this corner here and this corner here. Now this is what the harness would be in, let me view left again, coming down under the parachute. So we would be in a pretty level orientation here. Now before the parachute deploys, it's gonna be stretched back here. Let me uh, pull in a slightly different look at that. So this is a 10 foot length, so that's a little bit over three meters. So this is the front attach point. This is actually going to take the majority of the load as that parachute opens and deploys. And so as you can see, if you continue this line, it will come up to the tail 
and it actually passes through this prop. So if we're going forward flying in a fairly horizontal latitude when we deploy the parachute, it's very likely that this harness is going to be hit by the propeller. So if we're at a slightly higher angle of attack, let's say, what is that, about five degrees, then it will probably miss the propeller. So if we're cruising and deploy at 55 knots, we're almost certainly going to hit the propeller. But if we're at down around 30 knots or so, it's very likely that we will not hit the propeller. It's simply because the ultralight was going to have to be a higher angle of attack to be flying, and so that shouldn't be an issue. If we are stalled, uh, in that case, I'm not sure. I think it's unlikely that we'll hit the propeller if we're in a stalled condition. We're likely to be at a very high angle of attack there, and I don't think we'll hit the propeller with the harness. And note, this attach point and even the rear attach point should be above the center of gravity. Center of gravity should be right in here. So when it deploys, at least in this position, it should jerk the nose of the airplane up. And that's a more desirable situation. Now we could possibly have tried to attach it up here and actually just done two attach points. That's way above the CG and pretty close to the 25% cord. But that would only be two attach points. I wanted four attach points to help spread the load around. So I think this is probably the way to go. Now there's another interesting advantage of having this be the attach point. It serves another purpose. This longeron here, when this deploys, is gonna be in compression. So I'm gonna to have to design that to take that load during deployment to handle that compression load. But guess what? If we happen to have a nose down impact on the airplane and we hit here, Again, this Longeron is going to have to be in compression. And so having that long, stronger Longeron here because the parachute load will also help us in a nose down attitude impact and help keep this cabin area intact and not fail and cause the pilot's knees and such to come up and hit his chest. So I like that situation. So that serves a dual purpose here, having this attach point here, making this Longeron stronger. Now, before we talk about what we're going to talk about in the next video, I want to thank our new patron, Bill W. Bill signed on at the early bird tier, which means Bill gets to see videos five days before they go public. At least five days. I usually take a little bit longer, usually about seven days, but at least five days. Now, Bill, because he's become a patron, also gets full access to the Ultralight Airplane Workshop Discord server. So he'll get to join in our conversations that we have on general aviation, on aerospace, on lots of fun stuff. If you'd like to join Bill in becoming a patron, there's a link down in the description that will take you to the Patreon page for Ultralight Airplane Workshop. And there are several tiers that you can join. So look at those tiers, see what you'd like to have, see what kind of perks you'd like to have, and feel free to join us. Now, what's on our next video? In the next chapter of Dan Raymer's book, he talks about going back and now reanalyzing some of our stuff that we've done before, but in a little more detail, a little more accurately. So we're going to re-examine our aerodynamics, and that might take more than one video. I haven't looked at how I want to divide it up, but at least there's going to be an aerodynamics video, if not more than one. Then he talks about propulsion, so we'll get a little bit better idea of how well our propeller is going to perform, so that'll be a video. And then we'll get into structural sizing. So with that, we're going to get a little bit more serious about trying to figure out what our structure is going to be, trying to fill in a little more holes that we left before in our previous structure video, and start trying to analyze how much our structure is going to weigh, the various parts of the airplane. Following that, we'll do some stability, make sure this airplane is going to be easily flyable, at least hopefully. And then that will be the end of Chapter 7. So we got several more videos to look forward to. Well guys, thanks for watching. Until next time.